have been with us and having a good time, good food. Also, we're having an ice cream social tomorrow in Fellowship Hall from 5 to 7. So everyone, please come. We'll probably play games and, and eat lots of ice cream. And also, another thing on our announcements, we are having communion service next Sabbath. So um, everyone, please attend. Let us pray before we begin this morning. Our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us here, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you, God. We pray that our hearts will be prepared, our ears opened, and that we will be able to receive what you have a desire to provide to us. Father in heaven, Lord, 
Lord, we ask you to, to take this that you receive and use it for your glory and for your honor, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This leads us to our prayer requests, testimonies, anything that you want to bring to the Lord, this is the time to bring it. So uh, we'll start out with, who will be first? I would like for you to continue to remember Johnny uh, and his family. Miss um, June is making progress. She's had good days and bad. Uh, and remember me also. Amen. Sure will. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any more prayer? Uh, thank you. I would like to thank everyone for their prayers, for my family going through COVID. Um, I ask that you continue to pray for the little three-year-old. He's not feeling good. He's sick. There's something we're not sure yet. All things and everything. But anyway, please keep him in your prayers. His name is Trent. strong Muslim, him and his wife. But when American troops were there, he became an Adventist. And a strong Adventist. And uh, he, him and his family 
He, he was smart enough that he left the country. His wife would not change. She's still a Muslim. But he left the country in time that all this stuff, before this stuff happened. And uh, his children are going to an advanced school now. And I, I think in California, I guess. But that's a praise. I mean, you know, that they, were, they got out safe and everything. And, and, and he become an Adventist. And his two daughters, have, he got them in Adventist schools. So that's a praise. Go ahead, Ron. I got a praise uh, with Kathy and Glenn putting their music together. Amen. It's just been beautiful. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah, really, I've been blessed. Amen. We sure have. Amen. Any more prayer requests? Okay, I'm sure will. We sure will. Okay, any more prayer requests? How about unspoken? Anybody have an unspoken? At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer.
go into our last song. This is, this is really a prayer set to music. So as you're singing, pray in your heart to your Heavenly Father, who hears all prayers, and He loves to hear our prayers. And as we continue, if you choose to remain standing, you're so welcome to do that. If you choose instead to kneel, which is appropriate for a prayer, or if you choose to have a seat, you can do that also. Whatever position you feel, you want to worship your Lord. Oh, let me walk with thee. And if this is your prayer, sing it to your Heavenly Father. Caught in treacherous net, and, and birds trapped in a snare. So the sons of men are snared at evil time when it suddenly falls on them.
It's rolling. That's the title of the sermon today. It's rolling. It's rolling. Man, I, I, don't, I don't wish to embarrass you, but I love that beard, dude. That's awesome. I, I had one like, just two or three years ago. I had one just like that, didn't I? I, just, that's, I love that. Uh, rolling. It's rolling. It's rolling. Now, today, as somebody mentioned in prayer request, this is the September the 11th, which is the 20th year reunion or anniversary of the, 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 the tower strike where the Twin Towers hit, hit. 20 years. 20 years. It, and I, I was looking at it this morning at 8.45 in the morning, it, the plane struck the first tower. And then right around 9 o'clock, I think it was 8.46 and 9.03, but at 8.45, struck the first one, and 15 minutes later, a plane struck the other one. And how many of you remember where you were when you heard about it? That's strange, ain't it? I always heard of that. You know, people always say, oh, I remember where I was when Kennedy got shot. You know, and I, I used to, that just goes in one ear and out the other. You know, I really didn't mean much to me. But man, when I heard about 9-11, I remember it. I was actually at work, and I was in the, the QC department, and we were, they had radio on in there. And I, one of the guys, his head stuck to the radio, and having that guy to work for me. And I said, hey man, what, you, what are you doing there? And he says, are you hearing this? He says, they're, they're bombing. We didn't know at the time. He said, they're bombing the United States. And I said, who's bombing the United States? He says, they just, they just bombed the Trade Center. And, uh, of course, I went to listen to the radio, and we were listening, and it just blowed my mind, you know? And then I remember I went out to the shop, and I told a couple people out in the shop, I said, man, I said, they're, they're, they're bombing the United States, so we're, we're under attack right now. And I remember several people that said, no. They said, you're crazy. They said, there's no way. They said, there's no way that, there, there's no way that any, any country could bomb the United States. There's a little group of them got around me. To, to, you know, to psycho now and tell me that how stupid I am. And I said, oh, man, I said, that, I said something's going on. I said, they're, they, they're, they're bombing the buildings. No. Mm -mm. And I remember that day, because, you know, it wasn't 2001, you think. You don't realize how fast it comes along, but we didn't have cell phones and Internet and stuff like that. Just in our, you know, and I couldn't wait at lunchtime to go home and see what the news was saying about it. And when I did, sure enough, it's all the pictures of that. I couldn't believe it. There was something, wasn't there? Now, as many of you know, and some of you may or may not know, Ellen White wrote something interesting in Testimonies for the Church in pages 12 and 13. And in 1901, she said, in New York City, she named the city, she said, in New York City, I saw them building buildings higher and higher and higher, skyscrapers higher and higher. She said, in these days, they're going to catch on fire and they're going to burn and they're going to crumble to the ground. And she said the fire engine stuff aren't even going to be able to put them out. Now, she said that. It's always strange. You know, I'm, I'm not quick on quoting people and everything, but I always thought that was interesting. Why did she say that then about that? It is in 1901. 1901, you get that? 100 years even when she said it. And it was interesting because when she said it, the tallest building in New York City was 400 feet. 400 feet tall. I can jump that high. <laughs> That's interesting. But she saw these skyscrapers, right? And, and, and said that, man, that's something. That's something. But why did she say that a hundred years ahead of time? And I'm thinking that was, there had to be something significant about that event. Something significant. It had to mean something. And now let's get real. How many of you believe that since that day, for the last 20 years, the world has been a different place. Mm. If you're that old, right? Because mm -hmm. Satan has a way of doing that. In short generations, he can erase things. Mm -hmm. And people are born, they were born within the last 20 years. They think, man, this is the way it's always been. This is the way it's always been. But the world changed. It was like somebody flipped a switch. And we went to a different level. We went to a different time, a different world. We went to a different stage when that happened. And all the things that, that, that have occurred during that time and started occurring and, and, and world events and things that are going on. Have you ever gotten into something? And once you got on it, you got to moving with you? And you got, surely y'all have done this, some of you. I mean, as adventurous as I am, 
I've done this more than once. Got on something that was moving. And once you got on it, it got to moving too fast for you to get off. You ever done that? Back when I used to jump trains and stuff, and I was hobo would live and travel around on trains. I used to jump the train, you know. I had to chase it down. And then once I got on her, it'd get to moving so fast I couldn't. Uh, There's this little railroad bridge down here on the back side of town. It's a little tunnel that you go under. There you go. A little tunnel, you go under it, it dips in this railroad bridge. And when the railroad is blocked here, which next weekend now, I think it's going to be blocked up. The railroad is. So be ready for that. Leave house 30 minutes early so you can get around. So when this is blocked, you can go down the back or under the lift and go under. It's a small tunnel. Many of you know what I'm talking about. The creek down there. You go down by that river. school, go back off through the yonder. And in that little tunnel when I was a kid, we used to play on that bridge. Well, we played all over the creek, the tracks, everywhere. And so we, we used to get on that bridge. And the thing was, when, the, when we seen a train coming, there's a bigger bridge too, but this was a smaller bridge. When we seen the train coming, we would all get off, you know, because the train's coming. And so one day we got this idea and we said, you know what? When the train comes, because you ain't got like this three or four foot space on each side of the railroad tracks above that tunnel. He said, you know what? When the train comes, I'm just going to sit right here. Right? I'm going to sit on the edge of this bridge as the train goes by on the edge of the tunnel. And so the train came, right? And it got closer. And there's four or five of us there. And the train came, right? And the train got closer. And it got closer. And as the train got closer, a few of them said, no, man, I'm getting out of here, right? And it, the train got closer. But then there's a few of them. They said, no, nah, I'm staying no matter what. You know, I'm not leaving. And so the train got closer, and it got closer, man. And then it got to the point, I remember it got to the point to when the train was too close to change my mind. And so the train came by. And man, I remember, I looked up, and the train looked like it was like 90 feet tall. I mean, the train was like, you know, it felt like it was right here, but it was, it was, it was probably seven or eight feet away from me. It was going by. Yeah, and it didn't matter. Now, I was really cool. I was really cool. I was a superstar. But man, when I was experiencing that, being a superstar didn't matter, right? And, and all I could think about is, dear Jesus, I'll be glad when it's over, right? That's all I could think about because it was so scary. Man. And it was going by, and it's so big. And I was thinking, you know, I was logical because I was thinking, this train has come across this tracks a million times, and it has never tipped over or fell over, right? But all you can think about is it's going to fall. It's going to fall, you know? That's all you can think about. So the train went by. So then I got up and I came down, you know, with nothing. Right? But it was too late. I remember I was so scared. But as it was going by, about halfway through, I thought, man, maybe I can get up and walk off this and get out of here. But the thought of even just moving, the thought of moving was like, ah, right? And there's no way. It was too late. Once it got there, I was, I was alone for the ride. It was too late. And those people that Kathy mentioned in prayer that were trying to catch that airplane and get out of there. And I think about a lot of them. I watched the video, actually, a few times. And I think about it because the plane was leaving. I'm not sure you've seen this. Too, but the plane was leaving, and it was running down the runway. And there was a group of, I don't know, 8 or 12 of them that were up on the wheel. And you're thinking to yourself, or at least I'm thinking, what are they thinking? What are they thinking? You're going to hang on, you know, 400 mile an hour? <laughs> what are you going to do? And it's sure enough, I'm sure some of you heard the report that they found, they found it remains. And some of the wheels, what were they thinking? And as the plane flew off, you know, the reports that said they got so high and they saw some people dropping off. What were they thinking? And perhaps some of them might have thought, at least I, I send a chance of riding the plane out. I'd rather take that chance and stay here. But there was a point there when they were on it. And it took off. And it took off down the road and got to go on really fast. That it was too late to get off. It was too late to get off. Had to hang on. Have any of you ever hid when you were a kid? Your mom and dad looking for you? And it's funny games. But then after a while, they get tired of looking for you and they start getting mad. And you can hear them. Where the hell? If I find them, I'll tell you what, it's going to be the last time. Right? They're mad, right? So then after they're mad, it's too late because you sure enough don't want to come out then, right? And I had some... some in-laws by nieces, nephews by, by marriage. 
They hid like that one time. The parents got looking for them. They thought it was funny. Then the parents got mad. They were scared to come out. So then the parents couldn't find them anywhere, walking around the house, screaming, hollering, mad, looking outside, hollering, talking about, you know, talking about what they was going to do to them when they did find them. So they was still kept here. You know, they scared death to come out. They finally called the law. Law came out. When law came out, they got even more scared, right? They would have come out for nothing. Finally, they looked all over the house, looked everywhere, and they finally found them. They finally found them. They came out. But that was the, st that was the thing. As it got too far along, it was too late to jump out, too late to quit. And my we read a scripture today from Ecclesiastes chapter 9. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, man, there's a bunch of good stuff in that chapter. There's a bunch of good stuff in that chapter. And when I read this verse earlier this week, I thought, man, there's another good verse in that chapter. There's all kinds of good verses in, in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. But he read Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 12. And he said, for man knows not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Snared, trapped in an evil time when an evil time falls upon them. Now I would like to submit to you today that we are in that time. We are there. We're in that time. 2001, the switch was flipped, the world was changed, and we've been living in the last days. We've been living in the end since then. A little bit of poetry. You know, in Adventist, we're the worst. I've got a friend. He's a Baptist. A best friend in the world. And a really good friend. Been friends since we were kids. And we talk a lot. And one of the things that he told me, he said, Quentin, he says, I'm not worried about that mark of the beast. He says, I'm not worried about any of those bad things happening. I'm not worried about those plagues. I'm not worried about any of that stuff. And he says, I, he says, no matter what happens, he says, I know it's not that. Because we were talking about some things. We were talking about COVID, actually. And he says, you know, he says, some people think that this COVID thing is the mark of the beast. He says, I know it can't be the mark of the beast. And I mean, it's not the mark of the beast. But I said, well, how do you know? And he says, because none of that stuff can happen. Until after the rapture, Jesus is going to come and take us all away before any of that bad stuff happens. And I thought about that. That's so scary because when you believe that, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, plagues can happen, bulls can start cropping out on people, the water can turn to blood, all these things can start happening. And no matter how bad it gets, that's not what it is. Because you're waiting on this bus that ain't coming. But Adventists, we've got one too. We've got one too. You don't have to worry about anything. The end is, is never going to happen. Jesus is never coming. Here's something that Jesus will never come. You don't have to worry about it. Jesus ain't coming for another 500 years. That's just this happening, sure. Jesus will never come. You, you can kick back and take it easy, my friends. You don't have to worry. Because, here we go, this happens. Because the gospel has not been preached to all the world. We're waiting on that to happen. And once the gospel is preached to all the world, then all that stuff can happen. Not until then. I tell you, I sincerely believe that there's some big high up Seventh-day Adventist somewhere who's, who's sitting by a phone and he's waiting on somebody to call him and say, okay, we just got to preach the gospel to all the world. We just done it. <laughs> really? I mean, have you heard it? Have you heard evangelists on television? Have you heard preachers say Adventists? Well, we're waiting on the gospel to be preached to all the world. And it hasn't happened yet, I know, because I am Jesus, really. I mean, he don't say that, guys. I'm just putting that way. But we act like we know when the gospel is going to be preached to all the world. When that day happens and the hour comes, we're going to know it. I'd like to submit to you that the gospel's already been put out there. It's already been put out there. And some of these communist countries, you know, they're closing up churches and closing down churches and they're killing Christians and they're running it away. But the thing is, it's already in there. We've got it. It's been there, and it's going to continue to spread and seep around the world if it hasn't already. I am not waiting on the gospel to be preached to the world. I'm not waiting on a phone call to happen. I'm not waiting on that. As far as I know, it's already happened. Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and I want to begin here in verse 4 this morning. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 4. And they asked Jesus, they said, man, what's the sign of the end of the world? 
That's what they said in verse 3. What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? That was the question to Jesus. So in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, Jesus said unto them, He said, Take heed that no man deceive you. So that's the thing. You've got to be careful. Because people are going to come and they're going to try to deceive you. Right? And then he says this next one right here. Now Jesus is the one doing the talking. In verse 5, he says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. It shall deceive many. Do you get that? Or are you caught in a snare? Because he says, many will come in my name. And they're going to tell you that I'm Christ. But they're going to be teaching false doctrines and they're going to deceive many. Are you with me? So many people read that so many times. Look at that. So we're looking at false Christ, people pretending to be Jesus Christ. Jesus said, people are going to come in my name and they're going to tell you that I'm the Christ. They're going to be deceiving you. Not about me, but the things that they're teaching. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. He says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Have we, do we hear of wars, rumors of wars? Have we been that? I never have anybody argue with me over that. I never have anybody say, Now that has not happened yet. He said, these things will come to pass, but the end is not yet, he says. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, I want to ask you. You know, people try to play it down. They'll try to play it. always try to play it down. And I always like to look at things, you know. It's like the, 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 the COVID vaccine. I'm not against the COVID vaccine or anything like that. But I do see some stuff happen, you know. Like, I work around a group of people. There are six of us. Five of us got the shot. One of us didn't. And so three of us get COVID and are sitting home. And the one that don't get the shot, it's working. You know, I, you know because all that's, that's hogwash, you're insane, you're crazy, crazy man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And so my uncle... Here it is. And I, and I think that some people are brainwashed. I don't know. And I'm not against it. I'm just saying that there's stuff to think about. It's not just something to just say, oh, man, it's okay. My uncle took the shot. And when he took the shot, he had a stroke. I said, man, I don't know if I'm going to take the shot or not. And you know what he says? He said, ah, oh, that's just coincidence. That's just coincidence. I don't know. Man. I think, oh, that's my uncle. He's got genes just like me. I don't know. I don't know. So there's this thing on top of just being made to do something that you don't want to do. There's a lot of things I don't like about it. You know? But I'm not against it. I'm not a COVID shot or anything like that. None of that. As a matter of fact, I don't even know why I started talking to you about it. But anyway, the Bible says here, Matthew chapter 24. Oh, I know why. There will be famines and there will be pestilences. And there will be earthquakes and diverse earthquakes. Earthquakes. Since 2001, we had diverse places. Diverse places. I, be honest with me now. Be honest with me. Don't, 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 don't try to act smart. Listen. How many of you knew 20 years ago what a tsunami was? You actually knew. Somebody says tsunami, and you say, oh, yeah, I know what that is. How many of you really knew what a tsunami was? Oh, a couple of you were active. I didn't know what a tsunami was, and if I didn't know, you didn't know, right? That's like a baby sprinkler. Who knows what a baby sprinkler is? Who knows what a baby sprinkler is? Anybody know what a baby sprinkler is? That's an inside joke there. I didn't know what a tsunami was. Tsunami. I know what one is now. I don't even know what a tsunami is now, right? We know what a tsunami is now, don't we? And, 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 and really, how many of you knew what a Quran was? How many of you knew that, that the Quran was the Muslim Bible, right? I didn't even know what a Muslim was. I didn't know what, oh, there's just some strange far out religion, some weird people. I didn't even know, you know. Didn't know these things. But these hurricanes, the Katrina, the different hurricanes that come through, the disasters, the tornadoes, man, the stuff that's happening, flooding just up in, in Nashville, that kind of stuff does, I mean, wiped out the whole, the whole place. The, the weather has changed. The earth has changed. Global warming. Oh, it's not working. Missed it. <laughs> global warming. Global warming, right? That's what they say. It's global warming. Now, let me tell you what I think it is. I think it's not global warming. I think it's global sinning. Okay? It's global sinning. And because of sin, the world is waxing old like a garment. 
And if we read the Bible, the one thing that we understand is that this world is not going to be here always. It's not always going to be here. Just like we're getting old and feeble and worn, the earth is getting old and feeble and worn as well. All of these things. But one thing it says here is pestilences. Pestilence. Pestilence. And I looked at the definition of pestilence and it said a deadly disease that affects an entire community or nation. A deadly disease that affects an entire, entire community or nation. Now I'm going to ask you this. Have we experienced any pestilences? Yes. Are you seeing this? September the 11th happened 20 years ago. The world has changed. Things are changing. And we have experienced pestilence, but I tell you now, we have experienced the worst pestilence. This one really hits home, doesn't it? It really hits home. I remember SARS, you know, you see all those people, all those ridiculous people walking around with those masks on because they don't want to get the SARS. Ah! But now it's hitting home, isn't it? COVID-19. Right. Right. And now we got the Delta virus, right? And then there's another one out there. I, I forget what it's called. The, the something else uh, variant or whatever. I tell you what, I don't believe it's going to stop at that. Pestilences. Now the reason I'm telling you this, these pestilences, because we're all getting it, right? There's many of us sitting out here in the congregation right now who have been affected by this. If it hasn't got you personally, it's got somebody in your family. You've lost things, different things in your family. You've done this. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about the nation of Israel as they came out of Egypt. And you know, there were ten plagues. There were ten plagues that, that came to the, uh, the people there. And as you read through that, and you, you look in your Bible, and uh, in Exodus chapter 9, it talks about these, these plagues that, that, that God sent on these Egyptians. Because they were persecuting his people. They were not allowing his people to... To, to go out. And the first one was they turned the water to blood. And when they turned the water to blood, man, everybody had to put up with that. The, 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 Isra the Israelites had to put up with it. The Egyptians had to put up with it. Everybody had to put up with water to blood. Right? And then after that, as you're reading along there, it uh, tells you that, that frogs came. And frogs were everywhere. Right? Frogs were everywhere. It's always hard for me to keep a straight face when I read that. I'm like, frogs? <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, come on, frogs? I mean, you know, how bad can it be, right? But it says they were so bad, you know, that they were filled up in their houses. And then finally when they called the plague off, that they, they, they raked them out and piled them up in heaps. Frogs in heaps, right? Frogs. Affected everybody. And then the other one was lice, right? Lice. And it said turn the dust. Turn the dust to lice, man. Everybody. All of them. But then after those first three, there was ten of them all together. And after those first three, things start changing. After those first three things started changing, then, then they got flies. They were attacked by flies. Now I want you to look with me. Then the next thing was cattle. Uh, Exodus chapter 9 verse 4. And it says, The Lord said, And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is in the children of Israel. So when that fourth plague started, it didn't affect everybody. It just affected the Egyptians. God's people were saved. And then after you had the, the cattle, then there was boils that broke out on the people. And it says in verse 11 that he put the boils upon all of the Egyptians, but not the Israelites, not the other people. Then after that, we had a plague of hail that came. And in verse 9, in chapter 9, verse 26, it says, And only the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And then after that, they had darkness. And this is the one here that's most fascinating to me. In Exodus chapter 10, verse 23, when he cursed them with darkness, this extreme darkness, so dark you couldn't even see your hand in the front of your face. It was like a blanket of darkness over all of Egypt. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 10, verse 23, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place. For three days it was so dark they wouldn't even get out of the house. You ever been like that? Have you ever cut the lights out and been in the dark and it was so dark you were scared to move because you didn't want to fall over something? It was so dark they didn't even get out of the place. But the Bible says here, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. They had light. So what I'm telling you here this morning as I, as I just rush through these things is that there were ten plagues. The first three affected everybody. But the last seven, or should I say, the seven last, only affected the Egyptians and not God's people. 
What was the problem? What was going on there? If we look at Exodus chapter 5, verse 5, and I could go through the whole chapter, and you can look through the whole chapter too. It really becomes apparent when you go through the whole chapter. But in Exodus chapter 5, verse 5, it says, And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens? You want them to rest? You want them to rest? And so what he did is he made their load worse and put more work on them and more work on them. He says, so you'll have no time to rest. Let me ask you something. Do you think those guys will take a Saturday off? you think they were having church on Saturday? They were loaded down. The one absolute thing that Pharaoh did not want them doing is taking a rest or taking a break. The whole thing was about Pharaoh was going to not let the people rest. That's what he was about to do. But the next day he broke it up. Moses let him out. He finally said, you know, the first one, right? And, you know, I kind of go into all that, but there was a mark. There was a mark that the people had. If, if you had the seal, you had a mark, then you were passed by. And so they all came out, right? And he said, I'm going to make one last attempt to get them. One last attempt to get them, right? And then the sea was parted. The people walked through. And Pharaoh and his army came, right? And the water washed over them, and they were drowned in that sea, right? It's all right there. It's all going down the same way. We're the same kind. There's going to be seven last plagues. There's going to be a mark pass. There's going to be, the problem is that the, that, that the government, they're going to try to stop you from resting. That's what they're going to try to do. They're going to come up with some way to stop you from resting, from taking God's rest. Actually, that, that, that term there for rest is Sabbath. As Flo was saying in Sabbath school this morning, it means to stop, to rest, a holy rest. They're going to try to make you stop that, what God commanded you to do. And when that happens, they're going to be destroyed in a lake of fire. Right? The whole story is all there. The whole story is all there. And i got five minutes. I want you to flip back with me to Matthew chapter 24 right quick. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> it says, all these are the beginning of, of sorrows. These, these families and stuff, they're the beginning. But I want you to look at verse 9 because this is what's next. And this is what's unbelievable. Whoa, no, no way. Not going to happen. No way. But this is where we're at. We are living in between verse 8 and 9 right now. These things are the beginning of sorrows. And so you say, aha, it's the beginning of sorrows. So I've got plenty of time because it's the beginning. But we've already, remember, the ball is rolling. We're already on the train. It's already moving. It was a couple weeks ago, I was in a parking lot in my car, and I was sitting in the parking lot, and this car, it started backing up. And it started backing right up on me. And he got closer and closer, and he kept backing up on me, man. And I was mad, and I was fixing to honk the horn because he was fixing to hit me because I was sitting there, and he just kept backing up, backing up, backing up, like I wasn't even there. And then I, I, got, you know, I got nervous, and I hit my brakes in my car, and it stopped. I was rolling. <laughs> and I didn't even know it. I was rolling, and I didn't even know it. And that's the way it is. We've been rolling for 20 years. We've been living in the last days for 20 years, and we're totally unaware of it. We love to look around and find a reason, a niche, or a sketch, or a loophole to say, ha, oh, it's not time yet, it's not yet. Verse 9. After these things, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I'm going to try to run through this right here. But that's what's next. Delivered up to be killed. Mark of the beast. All this stuff talks about Revelation chapter 13. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And we are close to it, my friends. When you saw that report from the President of the United States on television this week, those are ways they are honing their skills at controlling mass populations of people on how things work. You need to watch those things and pay attention to them because the way those things are going to work and the way they learn stuff, that is the way they're going to enforce you not to take God's Sabbath day. It says in verse 10, it says, And then shall many be offended, and they shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise. Now the false prophets, you know, those are churches that are going around prophesy, to prophesy. It doesn't mean to kill the future always, but it means to preach. Okay? And the churches that are false prophets, they're going around giving a false sermon and a false message. And that false message is, you don't have to keep God's Ten Commandments. Those who are nailed to the cross, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't lie to me, but you don't have to keep God's Ten Commandments. Those who are nailed to the cross, they don't matter anymore. 
A false prophecy. And false prophets teach false prophecies. And they're going to go around and they're going to tell these things. False prophecies shall arise and shall deceive me. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Now that word iniquity means lawlessness. Verse 13, but he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Lawlessness. Lawlessness. Because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Cold. And I want to ask you a question. Why? I've got five minutes, guys, I promise. Why does love wax cold when there's lawlessness? Lawlessness is going to make the love wax cold. There was a question that they asked Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, verse 36. And they said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's the first four commandments. You know, right? know who God's before me. Make no images to bow down to him. Uh, honor my name. Love my name. And spend time with me, man. Remember the Sabbath day and keep holy. That's how you love God. He says, he says, there, he says the first one is love God. He says this is the first and great commandment. Verse 39. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? That's the last group. That's how you love your neighbor, man. Well, it starts at home with your family, with your mom and dad. You honor your mom and dad, right? And then after that, you get a spouse, right? And, 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 and you don't commit adultery. And then after that, you don't kill. You don't steal. You don't lie. You're not envious. That's how you love your, your God. That's how you love your neighbor. And he even says that. On these two commandments, hang all the law and all the prophets. But here's what I want to submit to you. The commandments are love God and love your neighbor. It's spiritual love for God and everything out there. And then it brings it home to mortal love for your neighbor. The Ten Commandments are all about love. It's all about love. So if you're practicing lawlessness, what's the book of James says? It says that if you break the law in one, you break it in all points. And if you're somebody practicing lawlessness, then you're incapable of having love. Do you hear me? So this false... Prophets are going to come out teaching a false message and they're going to practice lawlessness. And because they practice lawlessness, they will have no love. But he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. And I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. He that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. Now let me ask you a question. If you're going to endure something, what do you have to have? If you're going to endure if you're going to hang in there and you're going to endure it, I'll probably get two or three answers. But what do you got to have to endure something? Faith. What'd you say? Faith. Faith? That's a good one. No. Endure something. Hope. Hope. Hope's a good one. It's not, all these are good. It's not what I'm looking for. What do you, if you're going to have to endure something, you're going to have to tolerate, you're going to have to put up with it, you're going to have to hang in there. What do you got to have? The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is what's going to save us. That, that having the faith of Jesus Christ and following the laws and keeping, that's what's going to keep us love. That's what's going to make everything. That's what's going to do it in the last days. They're going to try to stop you from keeping God's law. Now, I had this friend. I got one story I'll tell you and I'll close. I had this friend. And this is a story that he told me. And <clears throat> I've looked up some stuff and it could very well be true. This was an old guy. He was an engineer. And we used to work together at a company that designed stuff for the government. And we were actually working on a commercial project. This was a hay, it was a CNC controlled hay biller that you could program to stack hay however you wanted to. It mounted on it. Right, anyways. And so we were talking. And Howard it came up, he said, you know, he said, nobody in my family is a dummy. He said, nobody in my family is a dummy. And I said, well, you know, I said, how do you think? And he said, well, they just talked. He told me about some people's names, something they did. And he says, this time, 
At this time, I remember I had been back and forth to Nashville on the interstate, and there was this big billboard sign. And there was these three men, and there was a woman, a lady. And, and these three men and a lady were standing on the billboard. And there was like two or three billboards, and they had these three men and this lady standing on this billboard. And on the billboard, it said something about finances and banking and marketing and all this different stuff. And I'm not sure what it was. And they, I think it might have been something about a big bank. But I remember seeing the big billboard, and the one lady standing there with three men. And he says, do you ever go on the way to Nashville on the interstate? He said, you see that sign there with that lady on that bill? I said, yeah. I said, I've seen that. I've seen that. He said, that's my daughter. I said, really? Yeah. He said, that's my daughter. Yeah. And I said, huh. He said, he said, he said you know how she got to where she was, because she, she's like a multi-man. He said, you know how she got to where she was at, don't you? And I said, no. I said, he said, well, she was a waitress. There you go. I said, oh, I really work hard, save your money, good tips. <laughs> he said, no. She had a husband that was a contractor. And her husband was a contractor, and he had a friend that did have some money. And he had an idea. He wanted to open up a restaurant. And he had some loose ideas. And the reason that she even heard about it is because he was friends with her husband, who was a contractor. And so she was overheard the conversation, and she got to talking with him about it. And she says, man, she said, if you're going to open a restaurant, she said, I'd like to work there. Waitress. He says, I'll tell you what. He says, he says, I got a group of people we're talking about. The restaurant, how we're doing everything. He says, why don't you just come and meet with us. Next week we're going to meet get together. He says, why don't you just come to the meeting? She says, well, I ain't got a business to come to the meeting. He says, well, if you want to work there, you can work there and stuff. He says, you might as well come. Get in the groundwork, see what we're going to do. So she says, okay. So she went to this meeting. There's like 12 people there. She says, they're just all just sitting around, you know. Nobody, there's no organization. Nobody's doing anything, nothing. She says, so she just felt, she just felt impressed to say, you know, what are we doing here? What's our purpose? What are we doing? And she got up and started drawing on the board and stuff, getting out, taking ideas and everything. She had this one idea. She said, you know, she said, we need, we need to have uh, uh, a store attached to the restaurant, to the front of the restaurant. We need to put a store on, on the front of the restaurant, attach them together, make them together. So anyway, they, they, they got that stuff, and he, he said, I think, he said, you know, he said, I would, you want to take charge of that? She said, are you crazy? He said, I'll take charge of it. Go ahead. You can do that. Right? And some of you, probably just from the little bit you heard, you know that that was Cracker Barrel. It started in Lebanon, Tennessee. And she just started that. Now, my thing and the point about this is what's so fascinating about that story is she had no idea that any of that was going on. She had no idea. She was just, you know, talking. Thing. Now, the contractor, her husband, he was the one. He said, you know, you can build it. And so he built the first one. And so that's how they all got started. He said, but, but she had no idea, you know, what was going on there. And, and, and in one night, there she was. It was rolling. It was going on. It was happening. And guys, you have no idea. One day we'll get to heaven. And we have no idea of the part that we play for God here in this world. Because it's happening. It's going. God's going to build a kingdom. It's much bigger than a restaurant. It's much bigger than a, than a whole chain and a national chain of cracker barrels. It's much bigger than all of that. It's a whole new world, guys. And we're in on the ground level. And everything you say, everything you study, everything you do, when you're grocery shopping, when you're working, when you're witnessing, when you're inviting people to church, it's critical. The time is at hand. And the time is now. We're not waiting on the end times to come. We're living in the end times to come. Amen. 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 Let's say our close again this morning. Amen. Father, lead me day by day. Is that correct? Yes. 